So let's let's talk a little bit about sexual health. So I think that all of this is going to tie in to to what we're going to uh, be talking about. But I think that there is so much taboo. I was telling you in the pre-chat, you know, my book, one of the, the subtitle was, you know, balanced hormones, intuitive eating, and then transformative sex. And <laughs> it was like, what? What do you mean? And I think that it's always been men are the ones who derive the most pleasure from sex. And maybe when we're talking about sex, you know, right now, I'm, you know, what I'm talking about is like heterosexual, penetrative sex. I often think for women, and I can even just speak to my own upbringing, you know, being Catholic, and it's like, you only have sex when you're married, and it's just for procreate, it's just right, for having right. children. I, I talk a lot about this in the book in terms of like our anatomy and how, you know, the clitoris is just, there's no other function for it other than it be, being there to, you know, to, to give you pleasure. So maybe speak a little bit about why our sexuality, our sensuality, our enjoyment of sex, and maybe the different ca- different types of sex is is crucial to our well being. Yeah, I think I think it's so important. You know, we it, this relationship between sexual health and longevity really gets glossed over. And I you know I speak a lot at longevity conferences. You know, these groups of people who are trying to slow down aging and extend lifespan and extend health span. And people are talking about all these different pieces, but but no one's talking about sexual health as a piece of that puzzle. And there's, you know, part of the reason is it's taboo. Part of the reason is we don't have as many good studies looking at sexual health as we do other types of health particularly. But, you know, there was a study in 2020 that that was a big study that looked at people who were having, you know, people who were having more sex and people who had sex at least once a week were had a lower mortality rate during this course of the study. Now, that's not necessarily causative. It could be more of a correlation. But when you are sexually healthy, you know, it means you're also physically healthy enough to have sex. You have a relationship with someone who can be your partner. And you're also probably spiritually healthy enough. You don't have any, you know, you have you don't have issues in that regard. You are emotionally healthy enough. So it's like, you know, it's kind of looking at all different parts of health. It's all wrapped up in sexual health. And we know that sex can has all kinds of benefits. It can help your hormones. It helps, you know, increases your oxytocin, which is really good for stress. It can help your sleep. It can uh, boost your immune system, decrease your blood pressure. You know, there's all these benefits to having sex if as long as it's it's enjoyable and it's something that you're that you're wanting. And I think that there we need to look closer, especially for women, at the relationship between sexual health and longevity. It's been it's pretty clear what it is for men, but there's not as much evidence for women. Wonderful. Okay, so that's that's awesome. Did it, did the study look at whether or not the 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 participants were in a was it a committed monogamous relationship? Was it just you know and this is you know and there's no judgment either way, right? It's sure. like whatever whatever works, whatever floats your boat. I have often talked about this idea that you know for me and my husband we you know we've been together for many years, and I love the idea of building our you know, our trust and our intimacy over time rather than it degrading over time. Like there is this narrative that there's this like, oh, this is ball and chain and you're just going to be roommates and you're going to have sex a lot in the beginning. And then it's just going to kind of fall off a cliff. And, you know, certainly there is some mating. There is some, you know, there's, there's a different kind of love. There's a different kind of maybe infatuation, let's say, with someone when you first start dating them. But I would argue that our relationship and this is just my own personal relationship has gotten better with time in particular the sex has gotten better with time as yeah. i've grown intimately with him my trust levels all of that so can can you talk a little bit about what they the, yeah. the participants were they in monogamous relationships polyamorous what, what did it look like that, did, i mean they didn't did say in the study yeah. as far as i remember they didn't i imagine that they were you know they're couples that they were studying but i don't i don't know that it talked about that I, there was a study in the 80s that was interesting that looked at the 22 different 22 pieces of lifestyle and how they affect affected longevity and what they found was that for men the quantity of sex was associated with longevity so men who were having more sex had a lot you know, longer lifespans, higher longevity. But for women, it was the quality of sex. Mm-hmm. And we do know that women who are in relationships tend to have better quality sex in terms of they, they tend to be more orgasmic. You know, it's like the percentage of women who are having orgasms, you know, with sort of early relationships or just casual dating, it's like 35 to 60 percent. I mean, it's really low numbers versus women who are in, in, a, in relationships tend to be closer to like you know, 85%. So, you know, that's only part of it, obviously, but I do think that there's some some value for sure in that. You know, the communication gets better, like you said, 
when you're with someone for a longer time period of time, certainly the newness goes away. But I think that there are other benefits that come along with it too. I had someone on the show several years ago now, and I have, and, and when I first heard what she had to say, I was like, oh, wow, that's so interesting. I've never heard that before. And I don't know if I agree with what she said. She basically said that a cervical orgasm or a vaginal orgasm is essentially superior to uh, a clitoral orgasm. And I was like, what? And, 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 so, and, and, and so I remember thinking like, oh my God, am I not doing it right? Because I really, you know, like the, <laughs> you know, like the clitoral orgasm is sort of like the best way for me. You know, I was like, well, maybe it's just me. Like maybe it's just, that's just kind of what works for me. But I do think that this is a bit of a, I don't know if this is like a myth from like pornography, because whenever you look at porn, it's like, mm-hmm. she, you know, she's like two seconds and then she's like, oh, this is the best or whatever. No, I'm not saying <laughs> that, but you know, she's like, oh, you know, whatever. Uh, well, you know, can, a Freud actually. <laughs> was the one was one of the early ones who said that who said that that basically vaginal orgasms were the best and if you're having clitoral orgasms like you're you're like you, he called women who were having clitoral orgasms mature uh, immature yeah like you're that's, immature that's what she that's what yeah. she was, I was and like, that oh, the wow, vaginal but we yeah. also know that only 25 percent of women can have orgasms from penetrative sex alone yeah. without clitoral stimulation so the rest of us 75 percent need clitoral stimulation. So I think that I don't think anyone should feel immature or less than. I think if you're having orgasms, then you should be happy and certainly experiment with things. But there is no right way to do this. Yeah, Freud was a tool on many levels. I'm just going to totally put it out there. <laughs> like misogynist had absolutely no idea what he was talking about when it came to female sexuality. But I remember at the time sitting for this interview and I was like, oh my God, that's so crazy. But then I've, I've had several sexperts maybe on the show since then talking about this idea that for most women, most women will climax with some type of clitoral stimulation. And we yeah. don't even, and the, the, the thing that's even, I think is even crazier is that, you know, we used to think that there was about oh, 7,000, 8,000 nerves. And I think now the number is up to like 10,000 nerves. And then yeah. it also extends into the bot. Like it, it sort of extends yeah. like where the, you know, maybe the G spot, you know, might be. So I think that there is this ongoing discovery for female pleasure and how that and 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 you know what constitutes female pleasure, which I think is also very very exciting as well. It is interesting. I mean, even even like what is the G spot is still a question. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's some people like it's not really a spot; it's a zone. Some people are like, you know, is it the back of the clitoris? Is it the back of the clitoris meeting the the urethra, meeting the skein's glands? Like, there's there's all these structures that are kind of in that area. But first of all, not everyone has a sensitive air. Like not everyone has this G-spot magical, you know, button that you can push and all of a sudden you're having 12 orgasms. Some people do, but it's, you know, everyone's anatomy is different. And I think that it, the most important thing is that that's the thing. Like everyone, the, the, the way that the nerves innervate the different structures is different for everyone. And that's so, you know, it completely makes sense that some people would find this pleasurable versus this pleasurable because we're all just hooked up differently. Yeah. I mean, God, we all squat differently too. You know, it's like, there's like some femurs are longer than others, like some active, you know, we yeah. we have different biomechanics. Of course, we're going to have bio individual, like we're going to have these differences, these nuances in our, in our innervation patterns as well. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about nitric oxide. So I would love in the context of sexual health, but also I think that translates to other areas uh, like mm-hmm. cardiovascular health and skin health and all that. How are we when we are, let's say, orgasming, or even just, maybe it's not even climax, maybe it's just foreplay and you are, you know, breathing a little heavier with your partner. Talk a little bit about what happens sort of mechanistically or physiologically. And then I'd love to specifically talk about NO. Yeah. So, you know, the there's the desire part and there's the arousal part. The arousal part is when your brain, you know, starts getting excited. So it's got dopamine hitting it, it's got testosterone hitting it, it's got melanotropinin hitting it, it's got all these different hormones that are saying, hey, we're excited, let's let's get excited. And it's sending signals then to your body to get aroused, right? So that's where you start having increased blood flow. And one of the signals that is sent to your blood vessels is nitric oxide. So you're increasing nitric oxide production, which is this, you know, this chemical messenger that tells your blood vessels to vasodilate to you know to get bigger so it can deliver more blood to your genitalia and nitric oxide is important for delivering blood all over your body and for keeping a lot of your um, cells healthy in general but it's very important for sexual health for men and women it's what causes erections for both men and women you know clitoral erections for women and regular erections for men and then that increased blood flow is also responsible for vaginal lubrication and women as well so the nitric oxide is a key piece 
And the problem is that as we get older, we make less and less nitric oxide. So by the time you're 40, you're making about half as much as your 20 year old friends. And so this, you know, the getting the blood flow is a problem. And in men, it's been well studied. We know, you know, we know we can look at erections and we can, you know, we can use a different different devices and kind of measure them and things. It's it's more difficult in women. We don't actually know as much about the role in blood flow in terms of like sexual dysfunction in women like we do in men. In men, we know that lack of blood flow is the number one cause of erectile dysfunction. In women, we suspect it's a cause, but we just don't know it because it's so much more difficult to measure those things in women. But and is there any is there any relationship with NO and estrogen? Yeah, actually, estrogen increases uh, nitric oxide activity, and so it's going to increase blood flow in you know various organs, including the pelvis, and it is going to you know nitric oxide also nourishes the cells in the endothelium in the blood vessels themselves. So you know so it, it does multiple different things. It's going to help your lipids. It's going to you know there's all different things that it does, and estrogen is a modulator of nitric oxide. And so are there ways, so we've been talking about HRT, let's say for dwindling testosterones or progesterone or estrogens, is there supplements, replacement, how can we, how can us 40 year olds keep up with (laughs) (laughs) 20 year olds with our (laughs) NO levels? (laughs) I mean, there's certainly lifestyle things that you can do. Exercise is going to increase it. You know, getting a little bit of sun, red light therapy does it as well. Breathing through your nose versus your mouth will increase nitric oxide. So there's, you know, some little tips like that. You can take nitric oxide boosting supplements. I like Dr. Nathan Bryan, his researcher has a line called NO2U, which I get no affiliation, but they have uh, some great like little lozenges that have some good clinical evidence behind them. So you can take that. And then you can also take, even though it's off label, you can also take the PDE5I inhibitors like Viagra or Cialis. And what they do is they prevent, essentially prevent the breakdown of nitric oxide. So it keeps your nitric oxide around longer. So even though those are not FDA approved for women, if blood flow is an issue, then those drugs can be helpful. Oh, that's really interesting. So off-label for women. Yeah, yeah. Ah. And can we measure NO? So I know that you mentioned like with men, it's very well established. Is there is there a way that we can measure it? And is there, let's say, a reference range that we might be aiming to... So you can measure it. I mean, you can sort of measure it. There are some salivary test strips that um, you can get from like Berkeley Heart or, you know, some companies just on Amazon that you can just put some saliva on a strip and it'll it'll turn different colors of change, uh, colors of pink, and it can tell you if you're low or high or medium. The problem is the actual gas that is in your body only lasts a couple of seconds. And so it's very hard to capture it. But I think the test strips are a good approximation, but then also just symptoms. You know, if your blood pressure is going up, if you're, if you're having erectile dysfunction, if you're having some of the, you know, if you're aging, if you have, if you're diabetic, if you have high lipids, these are all symptoms that are, that are associated with low nitric oxide as well. And tell us about the effects maybe that alcohol has on, I would say on our overall health, but in the context of this, this, this discussion, sexual performance and sexual function as well. Yeah, alcohol is interesting because in you know when you if you touch take a little bit of alcohol, some people will find that it's helpful for sex. You know, it, it it lowers inhibitions, and it can be helpful, and you feel a little bit like you know more. It can spice things up a little bit. But certainly after a couple of drinks, and depending on the person, it becomes a depressant. And so it's you know it's not only decreasing your mood and changing your ability to stay awake and things like that, but it's also changing the way that you're you're going to be getting blood flow to your sexual organs. And so you definitely want to you know maybe a glass of wine but certainly not multiple glasses of wine if you're interested in having sex.